this is the most impressive collection in one place I've ever seen, hands down. There's one theory which is that Islam doctrinally has an aversion to depicting living things. And in fact, it, this is not in the Quran, but as in the case of almost everything in Islam, the majority of Islamic law and dogma is not from the Quran, it's from the tradition of the Prophet Muhammad. And there's traditions that he said that whoever draws an image, or whoever creates an image, whether it's a drawing or a statue, uh, will be asked on the Day of Judgment to breathe life into that image, and if he can't, then he'll be punished. So the idea is that um, here it's the sense that in creating an image of a living thing, you are kind of acting like God, and only God can create. That's one tradition. Another tradition is that you know, the prophet said that angels don't enter the house of where there's a statue or a, a drawing of a living creature. What this led is to a general prohibition amongst Muslim scholars, sort of the, the rap. They're basically rabbis in the sense that their main job is not to be intermediaries between Muslims and God because there is no intermediary between Muslims they're and not God. Priests. Yeah, they're not priests. The main job is to be scholars. Their job is to study this Islamic scripture, preserve it, and then apply it to changing times. So in the kind of Islamic law that's developed by these scholars, there is a prohibition on depicting living things. Now, there's some exceptions to this because a lot of Muslim scholars said, you know, if you, let's say, draw a picture of a person on a carpet, you know, you have it in a carpet, you're walking on this every day. No one's going to think that you're venerating this or going to worship this like an idol because you're walking on it. Similarly, you know, if you, have a, if you have a picture of somebody on the seat of your saddle, no one is going to think that that's going to be a potential object of veneration or of idolatry because you're you know, not respecting it bodily uh, when you get on your horse. So there's some exceptions, at, even in the high Islamic tradition. But the important thing to keep in mind is that, uh, as in the case with, with rulers and powerful people all over the world, it's very hard for uh, ethical and legal standards to be enforced on them, even by the elite. So uh, throughout Islamic civilization, we know in court culture that there was actually a lot of representational art. In fact, even representational art of drawing the Prophet Muhammad. This was uh, not always followed, especially in court culture, but in especially mosque artwork, you're never going to see depictions of people or of, uh, of even of necessarily of animals. I'm going to talk, talk about the development of the Quranic text, because I know that sounds boring, but it's actually very interesting, at least I think it is. Because the Islam, Arabic as a language, and as an alphabet actually is standardized and formalized because of the Qur'an, for the purpose of the Qur'an, of preserving the Qur'an. And so, while as the Qur'an develops, you see the actual Arabic language and Arabic alphabet developing, and you start seeing the kind of problems that Muslims dealt with in terms of language. What does the Qur'an say about community? About community? Mm -hmm. uh, community is important. Uh, <laughs> I mean, so the, the Quran talks about Muslims being one community, mm -hmm. believers or brethren. The, if there's fights between members of the community, they should, they should reconcile. Um, and it says that Muslims are khayru ummatin ukhrijat lina. So the Muslims are the best, supposed to be the best community brought forth by God for mankind, and that they are ummatin wasata. They are a, a community of the middle way. Uh, but uh, community is extremely important. It's one of the main, the one of the major themes of kind of the Quranic social vision. What uh -huh. does community mean to you? People who share your values and will take care of you when you're having trouble, and you'll take care of them when they're in trouble, and you pool resources to try and, you know, it sounds cheesy, but make the world a better place and survive. Absolutely. That's, uh, not a very well thought out definition, but okay. I agree with you though. I think that's the process of affirmation for any religion, including Muslims, that yeah. the work through that. Um, also, what inspired you to be here today and engage with the Smithsonian to teach this to the public? I mean, that's my job. I'm, a, I'm an educator. Um, and so anytime somebody wants to learn about something, I do my best to be there to help them. And, and you know, I usually it's students in my university or other universities. So I, I really value a chances to talk to non-students. What do you think is the greatest challenge in bringing people together? Uh, well, I guess getting them to come to the events. Um, I, I think when you're talking to people, it's how to talk in a way that you're not going to be misunderstood. And not necessarily maliciously misunderstood. I think people just 
you tend to think that you're being clearer than you are. And I mean, I noticed that just in this talk now, you know, I'm always surprised by how did, I thought I very clearly said X and somebody thought I said not X. Um, and that's, it's tough uh, to, to, to keep that in mind. I try my best, but you know, you, that's why a question and answer is good. It's always good to, to, to ask the person, is this what you meant? Because it helps prevent misunderstanding. Absolutely. And I think you did a very succinct job of explaining the nuances of the language and placing dots in different places can have totally different. Dotting I's and meaning. crossing T's. Yeah. Yeah, there are dots here. There's no vowels. This is the earliest Arabic that we know. This is the you know, first century. This is probably from the late 600s of the Common Era. And this is what's called the Hijazi script. Hijaz is Western Arabia, where the Prophet came from. What that means is God makes the day go into the night and makes the night go into the day. He sort of uh, subordinated the sun and the moon, and each of them runs according to their appointed time. He's the one who makes boats go in the ocean, and he is the high and the mighty. If you don't sit around and read Arabic a lot, this is tough to read. It's, re it's legible once you know what it says, but if you took, you know, a four-year-old, you know, whatever, <laughs> ten-year-old Arab kid from school and say, read this, they'd probably start scratching their head. Um, it's kind of like reading, going into a church and reading Old English, like that kind of thing. You can figure out, once someone gives you a few hints, you can figure out exactly what it says. This is the early script. You can see this is not elaborate. This is not artistically pleasant script at all. This is just business script. The mid-700s, this is what's called the Kufic script, and this is developed more artistically. And you can see it's really, it kind of has this powerful sense to it. But here, you can see the dots are actually written as tiny little lines, and you have these red dots, which are the vowel markings. So here you have the vowel markings. Arabia prior to Islam, and Arabia during the early Islamic period is, uh, we only, the only records you really have are from Muslims themselves. So it's a story that Muslims uh, told to themselves, then transmitted, then tried to make sense of. And when I say tried to make sense of, I mean because something crazy happens, like a weird event that happens, everyone has different versions of it, and then they forget something, and they get confused with something else they heard, and then you, if you try to collect all those reports together, you'd come up, you'd have to try and figure out how to put them together, what's reliable, what's unreliable, and you have a mishmash of material. That's exactly what early Muslim historians faced when they tried to compile stories about their own uh, religion's origins. What becomes the Arabic script is actually borrowed from a northern Arabian People is called the Nabataeans. If anyone's ever gone to Petra in Jordan or seen Indiana Jones in the Last Crusade, and they go into that part uh, where the, the night guy is, uh, that's Petra, and that's the area of the Nabataeans. They were Semitic, they, were, they spoke Arabic, but they were culturally Roman after around 100, 200 AD. So our earliest inscription of the Arabic language is from the 300s BC, sorry, CE. And it's actually written in Nabataean alphabet, but it's, it's uh, Arabic language. Now, if you're getting confused about, wait a second, what do you mean written in one language and it's the yeah, actual thing being written in another language? Well, think about this. The word Quran is not an English word. The word Quran is an Arabic word that we write in English. So you can write any language in any script. You just have to come up with a way that is going to be efficient to, to get people to understand. Uh, you know, think when you're at a Chinese restaurant ordering you're reading an attempt to communicate Chinese words in, in, in an English script or Roman script. Okay, so the earliest Arabic inscription that's in Arabic is from the early 500s, the common era, and it's a rock inscription in Northern Arabia. And so that, by the time, the early 500s, we know there is a, an actual Arabic language, but it is highly underdeveloped. It's an extremely immature script. It's a defective script. By that, I mean not that people Decided or had it problems or weren't good at their job. But I mean, is it's, it does, when we think about the purpose of writing, we think that you can have, you know, this is what writing, writing is for, right? You communicate ideas very clearly in a lasting way to a large number of people who aren't just prisoner to hearing someone speak. That's not what writing is for in a lot of human history. It's, it's not actually probably why writing was developed originally. Writing is developed to communicate very simple ideas about commerce and ownership and things like that. And that's what Arabic was for. Arabic was for uh, early Arabs to basically talk about, you know, I left 
two bags of camel feed with you. Please feed my camel, I'll be back in two weeks. That kind of thing. Or I'm gonna buy three uh, sheep from you, in return you're gonna give me two uh, goats. That kind of stuff. I, I like to think of it as shopping list language. So you know, if you ever, if you still write shopping lists out in your hand and if you, if you go back, if you find a shopping list from like two months ago or a couple months ago and you look at it, what the heck is this? What, what was I writing myself? That day it makes sense to you because you know what you, the shopping list is there to remind you of what's in your brain. It's not there to be independent storage for, for information. That's the purpose of early era. As you go through, you look at the pages of the brands here, you'll see a huge amount of marking around the lines of the Arabic. You can think of Arabic script as lines and, and dots. You'll see dots, you'll see lines, you'll see a lot of little uh, slashes and loops and stuff. The, the original Arabic script was just lines. So you'd have something like this. Everyone can see that? That's, this, is the, er, this is how Arabic was in 550 of the Common Era. This is how Arabic was when the Prophet Muhammad, when his prophecy began in the year 610. This is what Arabic was. Now, this could be a lot of things. When, you, when they start, by the around 640, so within, the Prophet dies in 632. Within about 20 years, we know this from rock inscriptions, Within 20 years of his death, they've developed dots to, in, to, to distinguish between different letters. What do I mean by that? Okay. This could be a couple different things. This could be, that means bait. Bait is house. See, I put the dots here. Get rid of those. It could be theft. Theft means strong or firm. Okay. This isn't even vowels. This is just distinguishing between consonants. Uh, it could be bint. Bint means girl. It could be a lot of other things. So, you, if you saw this on its own, you would not know what it means. You would have to know from the context. Now, that wasn't good enough because, and this is the case with Arabic today even, they didn't write short vowels. So you can think of an English sentence like this. This, even today, if you open an Arabic newspaper, this is what you'll see. If it were to, what does that say? Anyone have a guess? I hit the ball. I hate the bill. That's true, right? So, you could, if you were a if you were a rodeo clown, you might say I hit the bull. If you were a working in a the National Cathedral as one of the bell ringers, you could say I hit the bell. So you'd have to know what the context is to be able to, to read it. This is how Arabic is today. Okay. Uh, though. That's great if you're it's a newspaper article where context is clear, but when it came to the Quran, it was extremely important that the Arabs were able to read uh, the Quran properly, and so they developed symbols for the short vowels. But what's, I think what's really, so you, it's, you would have, for example, this is an Arabic word. It's the consonants M, well, MLK, like Martin Luther King. It's MLK. That means the root is sort of ownership or dominion. It could be mulk, which means dominion. It could be milk, which means property. It could be melek, which means angel. It could be melik, which means king. It could be, what else? Uh, Muluk, no, that's not a good example. It could be melika, a verb which means he owned. It could be mulika, a verb which means it was owned. So you could see that uh, even, even 
if the, the, the short vowels are not always written, which they weren't in the early Quran, Arabic is a different way of thinking about language. It's a different way of thinking about language. Uh, if you look at this wall, we can, you know, the Quran also describes God as the creator of the universe and of all living things. We can sit and have a long debate about what that means. But we all know what that says. There's no debate that describes is described. It's not described, it's not described, right? <laughs> um, but what, I think I put the top here, thanks. What, the, what this means about Arabic is that it's a, and this is borne out by the way that Muslim scholars thought about the Quran. It's a, it's a kind of fluid language. Things don't, even something that's written that is a text, a, a set text that you believe is firm, is established, is unchanging, it's like it has different valences, it has different, si different light cast, different uh, shades on it. And we'll talk about that when we discuss the different readings of the Quran. But that was kind of just a, an introduction to uh, how the Arabic script developed in the, in the very early period, within the first two generations, within actually the first full generation of Muslims. So by the early 700s, they had developed these, or within 20 years of the Prophet's death, they developed the dots for distinguishing between consonants. And when the first uh, let's say 70 or 80 years or so, they developed the vowel, short vowel markings. All of these developments in the Arabic language are for the purposes of preserving the Quran. That's what I meant when I said Arabic, Arabic script and the Quran, they are in, linked intimately from the very beginning. This Arabic script is developed for the Quran. Another thing to keep in mind, the Arabic language is developed around the Quran. So Arabia at the time of the Prophet was extreme, it was like a linguistic ocean of different, you know, cur currents and, and types of, of language. So you had South Arabian, which is very close to Arabic, so it's kind of like maybe, um, you know, French and Italian. Uh, you had lots of different dialects in Northern Arabia to the extent that some, you know, it wasn't clear there wasn't like Arabic language and there's variations of it. There was no <coughs> Arabic language. There were just lots of dialects that were all related to each other. Now the Quran seems to have been revealed in a mixture of the dialect of the Prophet's tribe, the Quraysh, in Western Arabia, and the dialect of a major Central Arabian tribe called Tamim, the Tamim tribe. Uh, that's what it seems to be a mixture between these two dialects. But what happens is it's formalized in the Quraysh dialect with some borrowings from the Tamim dialect. Now, uh, what this it, it, tremendous diversity of, of language in early Arabia meant was two things. One, Muslims who were at that point, well, the people who did the work were mostly non-Arabs. They were mostly Persian converts to Islam. In the 700s especially, they actually had to try and formalize and standardize the rules of Arabic. And so a lot of the Southern Arabian variations got kicked out. A lot of the uh, different tribal dialects got uh, kicked out. And uh, in people say, oh, Arabic has 100 words for lion or 50 words for camel. That's not just because people like lions or camels, it's because different tribes had different words for camel. So you, it's not just that you had, you know, it's like uh, you know, going to different parts of America and there's you know, soda, it's pop, it's Coke here, things like that. It doesn't mean that we, we all go around and somehow you know, are able to use all these words because we have such a rich language, it's because it's regional variation. You get some kind of standardization in the standard language. The second thing uh, they had to do was to figure out how to deal with this variety when it came to the Quran itself. Okay, so here's a brief history of the compilation of the collection and compilation of the Quran. Again, there is no you know, it wasn't like there was a Christian Byzantine monk who happened to be visiting Mecca and Medina during the time of the Prophet's career, who was writing letters home saying, this is really interesting, you'll never believe what happened today. This, you know, 
The, the earliest non-Muslim report we have about Islam is from the year 634, so two years after the death of the Prophet. And it's a, written in Greek, it's, a, it's from North Africa, and it's an anti-Jewish text where a guy shows up from what's basically Palestine, and in the course of their bagging on Judaism, he happens to mention that this prophet has arisen in Arabia, and they've taken over Palestine and deposed the Roman rulers there. And he says, uh, he claims to, to, to come in the tradition of Abraham, and he has the, claims to have the keys to heaven. And he thinks he's the, the, the Christian guy thinks this guy's the Antichrist, this prophet, just to be clear. So, but we don't, uh, we don't have a lot of information about the details of the prophet's life, except from Muslims. And so, uh, maybe you know the overall uh, story. Around the year 570, Muhammad is born as one of, in one of the noble families of the Quraysh tribe, which rules Mecca, which is a local pilgrimage center for different, where different tribes have their local gods in the Kaaba, that cubic building. Uh, in the year 610, he gets revelation from God, um, telling him to read in the name of the Lord, Lord who created man from a little clot of blood. Read for your Lord is most bountiful, taught man by the pen, who taught man what he does not, who did not know. And that's the first revealed verses of the Quran. And then uh, he uh, basically uh, starts preaching monotheism, some of, uh, especially poor members of Meccan society, become his followers. They run afoul of the, the Quraysh rulers because they're threatening their pilgrimage business, their polytheist pilgrimage business. And uh, eventually, after a lot of torture and killing Muslims, the Muslims flee. First, a number of them flee to Ethiopia. And then eventually, in the year 622 of the Common Era, they go to a city north of Mecca called Yathrib, which is renamed Medina, the city, the city of the Messenger of God. And at that point, the prophet is actually the leader of a large community. He's a political leader, a legal, a judge, an administrator. And uh, he engages in a war with the Meccans to try and basically be able to return to his home. Eventually, the Meccans are defeated. And all the tribes of Arabia, by the end of the prophet's life, have embraced Islam and joined the Muslim movement. And after the prophet's death, there's this huge ex expansion outside of Arabia. Okay. Um, now, the Qur'an, Qur'an means recitation. Uh, the Qur'an talks about a, itself as a book, but it's important to keep this in mind. The Qur'an didn't drop out of the sky as a bound book or a scroll or anything like that. The Qur'an didn't exist as a book during the life of the Prophet. When we talk about book or kitab, it's not the idea that you have a written document that's between two covers or rolled up or something. Kitab means a book from God, a revelation from God. And that's why the people of the book in the Quran, the Ahl Kitab, they are the, they are the previous groups who got Abrahamic revelations, like the Christians and the Jews. They are the possessors of revealed knowledge. And by the way, in Yathrib or Medina, when the Prophet went there, it was majority Jewish. Arab Jews. And the people who served as the prophet's scribes writing down the Quran during his life were educated in the Jewish schools of Yathrib. So they learned to write Aramaic and, and Hebrew. Okay, so during the time of the prophet, he'll, uh, he would receive revelations and this would come down to him. He would start sweating sometimes. He would put his head under a cover. He would be almost physically shaken. This is what the reports say. And then he would recite what he had been revealed from God by the intermediary, uh, intermediary uh, archangel Gabriel. And then he would tell this to his, some of his scribes and they would write this down in just an informal kind of running collection. But the, major the way that the Quran was absorbed and appreciated by the Muslims at the time was as a oral scripture. So some different companions of the Prophet had their own written running versions of the Quran, but there was no official version. The scribes would write things down. The Prophet might tell them later, you know, put this verse after this verse, put this verse in that chapter. So the Quran is not revealed chronologically. It's not, it's not written chronologically as we 
have it today, and it's as it's always existed. It's written as the prophet arranged it, and it's also not a narrative. This is a very big difference between the Quran and let's say the Bible. There's not the beginning, the middle, and the end. There's only one chapter of the 114 chapters of the Quran. Chapter number 12 is its a self-contained narrative. It's the story of Joseph. But everything else in the Quran, you might find segments that are a narrative, but it's really a almost like a stream of consciousness if you read it. So sometimes it's, it could be talking about the importance of believing in God, the importance of doing good deeds, fearing the day of judgment. Look at the signs of nature and the signs in, of your own history to see the oneness of God. Then it might tell you the story of Moses. Then it might say, and then the people say this about Jesus. Then it might say, uh, and they ask you about divorcing your wives. It's really just this, um, there's been a lot of effort by different scholars to try and look at the Quran as a literary work. And it's a really, I mean, that's a huge task. And there's been uh, some impressive work by, done by, by scholars, but it's a, it's, a, it's a different experience reading the Quran than any other book that I've ever read. Certainly not what the Judeo-Christian tradition is used to in terms of scripture. The, the Quran is revealed piecemeal during the 23 years of the prophet's career. And a lot of times it's revealed dealing with a specific issue that comes up or talking about an event that's happened, let's say a battle that was fought or a dispute between the Muslims, amongst the Muslims. Sometimes it's just giving guidance, sometimes it's giving laws. And uh, uh, the Quran actually talks about this. It says, they ask you, the opponents of the Prophet ask you, Muhammad, why doesn't it come down as one book at one time? And the answer that God gives is, Thus do we make firm your hearts. So the idea is that the Quran, by coming down in response to issues, is able to answer questions, not just give one uh, kind of dispensation and then let people argue about it. So, like as I said, during the time of the Prophet, there is no Quran. There is no one written version of the Quran. It's only during the reign of the first caliph, Abu Bakr, who was a close friend of the Prophet, one of his earliest followers. He reigned from 632 to 634. uh, There's a a battle that's fought, and I'm not going to do something that the Prophet didn't do. But then he thinks about it, and he realizes this is important to protect the Quran. And so he orders Zayd ibn Thabit. Zayd ibn Thabit was one of the scribes of the Prophet in Medina, who was educated at the Jewish schools of Medina, who knew Syriac and Hebrew. And, uh, of course, he could write Arabic, and as it was at the time, he orders him to go and compile the Quran. And what he does is he goes around and he finds, uh, for all the different companions who memorize the Quran, he makes sure that for every verse, or someone who claims there's a verse of the Quran, that there's two people who witness this be revealed, and that there's at least one written, uh, someone who's made a written record of this, of this verse. And then that's compiled into one, Mus'haf, Mus'haf is a, originally, actually, it's a, a Ethiop, Ethiopic word. By the way, when I talk about early Arabia was really linguistically diverse, this is what I mean. Ethiopic, so even today, Ethiopian languages are Semitic languages, but that, back then they were really close to Arabic. So a lot of words, especially involving writing and preaching, were actually from Ethiopic, even in the Quran. Uh, you have words that are from old Ethiopic languages. Okay, so the Mus'haf means pages, basically bound pages. Why, you might ask, was there not some formal written version of the Quran for the life of the Prophet? Well, writing was extremely difficult. Today, writing is easy. You go and you buy a bunch of paper and you write stuff down. Paper didn't exist. It only existed in China, and it didn't come into the Middle East until around 790 of the Common Era. Prior, if, if you wanted to write something down, you had to write on parchment, treated animal skin. You had to write on papyrus. These are very expensive, very expensive. And Mecca and Medina were extremely poor places. They're basically subsistence economies, extremely poor. So most of the writing that was done was done on uh, the sheaths of palm trees. If you go to you know, a palm tree and there's this, if they're not manicured well, you get these ugly kind of cardboardy like things that just, grow out of the trunk. If you actually rip one of those sheets out, it's really fibrous, but you can scratch writing on it. Uh, They would also write on broken pieces of pottery. They would also write on these shoulder bones of camels. You can imagine trying to read a Quran that's written on shoulder bones of camels for your bedtime reading, right? This is going to be very difficult. So writing is not something you do 
You, know, you don't have your own massive collection of written records. So the earliest copies of the Quran that one compiled by Zayd ibn Thabit was done on parchment, on animal skin. And then what happens is, during the reign of the third caliph, Uthman, another early convert, close friend of the prophet, he rules from 644 to 656. So by that time, Muslims have taken over, by 650 they've taken over all of the, what we consider the Middle East, most of North Africa. They've gone all the way into what's today Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan and Central Asia, uh, taken over all of Iran, uh, the Caucasus. And uh, what happens is that there's reports come back to Uthman, the caliph, that people are reading the Quran in different dialects, different Arabic dialects. And he gets concerned about the potential variation in the book. So he orders one official promulgated version of the Quran. And it's unclear exactly, was that based on the existing version done by Zayd ibn Thabit or did you just consult it? But what happened, either way, he creates a consonantal text. Remember when I wrote out the consonants? That the, not the vowels, the consonants were standardized. That was promulgated throughout the Muslim world and all the other uh, versions were destroyed. We know some of the Muslims preserved some of the variations that, it, that had come into existence. For example, in Kufa, there was one, one of the companions of the Prophet had his own Mus'haf of the Quran, and there were some variations in wording. For example, in one verse of the Quran, it says, uh, when the Friday prayer is called, hasten to the, me to the me remembrance of God. In this Kufan version, it says, go to the remembrance of God. A uh, different word, instead of hasten, kind of walk to or go to. So the same general meaning, just one word difference. So from that point on, the consonantal text is standardized, around 650 of the Common Era. And that's the case until today. Now, of course, as you learned, that doesn't mean that the, what the actual reading of the Quran is, is standardized, because there's still dialectical variation. And there is apparently, according to what we know, that variation was allowed by the Prophet. Because, you know, it would be like if you had someone from rural Arkansas and someone from the Bronx and someone from Southie in Boston and they're all reading the Gettysburg Address. They're reading the same thing, but you're going to have different pronunciations of that. So in one sense, it's, it's understandable that you'd have variation. But in Arabic, some of that variation actually can change the, the meaning very subtly. So, for example, I gave you the case of that word MLK. So the Quran talks about two MLKs, Harut and Marut, who uh, came to earth and basically uh, kind of got into trouble and were punished by God. Now the standard voweling is Melek, two Meleks, two angels. And this is, by the way, getting harking back to some uh, Midrashic tradition in uh, Judaism, kind of Hellenistic period Judaism of how evil comes into the world that comes into the world by intermingling between angels and human being. But there's a problem here theologically because according to Islamic theology, angels don't have free will. Human beings have free will. Angels don't have free will. So how do angels mess up? <laughs> One possibility is God sort of makes this possible for these two angels because it's part of God's plan. The other possibility is that they are not two meleks, they are two meleks, which means two kings. And them getting in trouble is more understandable. So you can see how some of these, these readings, just another example, uh, we probably have to end soon. I didn't even get to show you anything, I've been talking the whole time. But the, you can look at all this stuff by yourself. The, uh, another good example is over the issue of um, whether or not God can, can create evil. So the one verse of the Quran says, uh, we seek refuge from God, or with God, we seek refuge with God, min sharri ma khalaq, from the evil of what he created. So that's the general opinion of, let's say, in Sunni Islam, is that God can create evil because God does whatever he wants. And you can't say God's unjust because God is the definition of justice. There's no way, there's no external definition of justice you can hold God accountable to. So 
the, but there's one group of Muslims, there was a minority that said, no, no, God cannot create evil. So what they said, it's not min sharri ma khalaq, from the evil of what he created, it's min sharrin ma khalaq. What that means is, we seek refuge with God from the evil he did not create. <laughs> so it's all, all that is just in the devouring. Now, yeah, but it's, it divides people. What do you mean? You create sex. Well, that's my, I mean, that's an, so my point is that sometimes these vowelings can create differences of interpretation. But unlike, let's say, English, the differences of interpretation aren't because I think king means one thing and you think king means another thing. It's because you think it says king and I say it, mean it says, uh, I think it says angel. But these, uh, these are actually not that common. The big diversities and disagreements uh, and causes for disagreements amongst Muslim scholars in Islamic law and theology are not because of variations in the reading of the Quran. They're really because of disagreements over uh, things attributed to the Prophet Muhammad, and then just general principles of what is possible and what's impossible for God, kind of rationally. Right. So those are the main disagreements, not the vowing of the Quran. I just wanted to give you those as examples. What you see in some of the oldest pages of the Quran that have been preserved, especially some that were found in the roof of the great mosque in Sana'a, the capital of Yemen in 1979, you can't just throw Quranic writing in the streets. You have to burn it or throw it in the ocean. If you have a bunch of pages with Quranic language written on it, you sort of don't know what to do with it. It's kind of like when you, you have some receipt you think you're going to need and you just end up putting it and you just get it just sits on the shelf somewhere for two years. It's sort of, they just stuffed it in the roof, or the ceiling area, crawl space. And it was, it's basically garbage. Literally, it's garbage. But they didn't know what to do with it. But what it has is some extremely early pages from Quranic uh, writing. And on some of them, you see that the pages are framed with this very primitive architectural design of a building which is very similar to uh, existing artistic styles there, and also from Armenian Christianity, which is really weird. The canon tables at the beginning of Armenian Bibles at the time. The artwork, the tile mosaic artwork of the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus is a representation of these buildings and gardens, and it's, there's different theories that it's the Muslims trying to represent paradise, but whatever, you'll see this sort of similar vegetal design as you see here. That, that mosque was, that artwork was done by Byzantine artists, built by Muslims, but the people they brought in to do the tile work were Byzantine artists. This is important to remember. Early Muslims were an extreme minority. The, Iraq, in the year 800, Iraq was only 18% Muslim. It didn't become majority Muslim until the 1000s. Egypt didn't become majority Muslim until the 1100s. Iran didn't become majority Muslim until the 1000s or 1100s. So Muslims for many, many centuries were ruling over a very small number of people ruling over massive non-Muslim populations that only gradually converted to Islam. And initially, the attitude of Muslim rulers, they didn't actually want people to convert because then they wouldn't get taxes from them. They wouldn't pay as many, <laughs> much taxes. And two, uh, I, I don't think this is a religiously correct belief. And in fact, this had to be corrected by one of the early caliphs in the year around uh, 720. He had to correct this policy. If you converted to Islam but weren't Arab, it was actually very hard to get that conversion recognized. You would, they were still charging you the non-Muslim tax. <laughs> and so in 720, the Umayyad Caliph Omar II he said, no, 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 everybody who converts to Islam is has to be treated equally. But the initial, they initially didn't really want, Muslim, when they conquered the Middle East, they didn't, they mostly set up, set up cities outside existing cities because they didn't want to mix with the local people very much. So the, the Quran talks about Muslims being one community um, and it says that Muslims are umat and wasata. They are a, a community of the middle way. Community is extremely important. It's one of the, main the one of the major themes of, kind of the Quranic social vision.